And we're going over this phrase that shows up every once in a while here. Like, for example, in uh, verse 14, at the end of verse 14, it's an eternal decree for your generations in all your dwelling places. What is that? Uh, you, would, you would assume, normally, that something is going to be an eternal decree. Um, so when it's when it shows up, it's supposed to be uh, Ramban, Ramban thinking it should be teaching us something. So last week we talked about the fact that Yom Kippur has this idea here in the in the commandment about, about Yom Kippur, because you might think that there's no Yom Kippur if you don't have a temple, and that there's no you know there's no point in doing the Yom Kippur day at all if you can't bring all the uh, offerings. So that to to teach us that that would not be correct, the Torah says, "For all your generations, all your dwelling places." For the Sabbath, it just says, "In all your dwelling places," because you can actually kindle fire in the temple in order to um, in order to uh, facilitate the offerings. Now he's going to go through a couple other instances of this phrase. So in uh, Leviticus three seventeen. It says, in, in connection with the prohibition against consuming chalev, fat, in blood, it says in a, it's, a, it's an eternal decree for your generations in all dwelling places. Why is that? Well, because you might think that it's only forbidden because those are parts of the offerings that go on the altar. The blood and the chalev go on the altar. So you might think, well, if you're not sacrificing any animals, it's fair game. The chalev is not going anywhere else. You might as well eat it. Well, no, it's it's an eternal decree for all your generations, not your dwelling places. You can't eat chalev or blood. <coughs> There's another opinion in uh, the Gemara about why the dwelling places in your dwelling places is written in connection with the Sabbath. In this chapter, Leviticus 23, verse 3, which is that the uh, it might have entered your mind to say that since the Sabbath is written in the passage of the appointed festivals, the Sabbath should require sanctification of the court, like the appointed festival. Therefore, it informs us by stating in all your dwelling places that the seventh day is automatically sanctified as the Sabbath and does not require the sanctifi sanctification of the court. Right? So sanctification of the court means that for most of the festivals, for Pesach, and by extension, for Shavuot, which was counted from uh, Pesach, um, and for Sukkot, for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, all of these festivals fall on a specific day of the month. And you don't know when that day is going to be unless you know when the first day of the month is going to be, so you can count from there. And in ancient Israel, the first day of the month was uh, proclaimed, it was sanctified, it was decided by the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin had to say, look, this is the first day of the month. Tell everybody so that everyone knew when the festivals are going to be. But they don't need to do that for Sabbath. The Sanhedrin doesn't need to say, by the way, we counted seven days and it's Sabbath again. Everybody knows already. It's automatic, automatically sanctified as the Sabbath. Ramban continues, Whatever explanation we adopt, the general rule is that we'll, it will not mention this expression in all your dwellings in the Torah in connection with any of the commandments that are a personal obligation, except on account of some particular need except to, you know, to avoid confusion, and like in the instances we just said. Now, there's another instance of a similar phrase, from your dwelling places, which is in verse 17 of this chapter. From your dwelling places. I don't think we've read that verse yet. From your dwelling places you shall bring bread that shall be waved, two loaves made of two tenth ephah, they should be fine flour, they should be baked leaven. First offering to Hashem. We did read that verse. But, um, so what does it mean from your dwelling places? What does that mean? It means to ex it's uh, it has to come from the land of your dwelling places to exclude bread brought from outside the land of Israel. So when you come to the dwell the land of your dwelling places, you know you have to from the from that land you have to bring the uh, grain for the omer and two loaves. That's in the Mishnah. 
It's in the Mishnah. So it's the law. All communal and private offerings may come from the land or from outside the land, but the Omer and the two loaves for Shavuot have to come from inside the land. And Ramban continues, even according to the opinion of one who says that the Omer may come from outside the land. So there's a, there's a divergent opinion. There's a dissenting opinion in the Gemara. Someone says, well, I think the Omer can come out from, from outside the land. But he even he says the two loaves have to come from inside the land. They have to come from inside the land. Can't use wheat from just anywhere. We shall be baked leavened. The use of leavened bread in the temple service is not normal. Right, It's a little bit different. Usually you uh, see unleavened bread for the meal offerings and such. Um, right, so... Scripture commands, Raman says, Scripture commands the two loaves shall be leavened because they are thanksgiving to God for the fact that he preserved for us the ordin ordinances of the harvest. In other words, um, it, the the weather was correct for the wheat to dry out in the field so that it could be harvested. And, it, and because it's basically a thanksgiving offering, in that sense, because it's a thanksgiving offering, it comes with leavened bread. Um Thanksgiving offerings have leavened bread. They're not offered on the altar. There's never any leaven on the altar. Um, you know, except maybe these, I don't know. But um, the, for Thanksgiving offerings, they're, they're not offered on the altar, but they are part of the offering. The priests get them. So it's a Thanksgiving offering. That's what this is alluding to. Although there's a deeper meaning, um, a Kabbalistic meaning, according to Ramban, the um, fermentation is an allusion to the attribute of justice, and um, because it has the power to change the nature of a thing, right? So fermentation can turn juice into wine. Fermentation can turn, um, you know, unleavened bread into leavened bread. So these something that's that has the power to affect that kind of change in the physical world is a hint of the attribute of judgment. Something entirely sweet, like honey, is indicative of the attribute of mercy. So, you know, honey is not allowed on the altar, and leaven is not allowed on the altar. So, so instead you want some something in between. So you want some balance of justice and mercy. Um, when, when God created the world, he founded on justice, but he, he mixed mercy and justice together in order to create the world. So that mixture is important. Um, so the leavened bread here is indicative of justice. However, all the meal offerings the uh, for the animal sacrifices on this day will be unleavened. So there's a mixture of both kinds of bread here, and it's indicative of that balance. And Ramban reminds us that in the world to come, all the sacrifices will cease except for Thanksgiving offerings because in the world to come will be a perfect balance of mercy and justice, whereas sometimes in this world we see only mercy or we see only justice. All right. I think we read all the way through verse 21 last week. We'll start in, in, in verse 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not remove completely the corners of your field as you reap, and you shall not gather the gleanings of your har harvest. For the poor and the proselyte shall you leave them. I am Hashem your God. Why is this verse here? We've already had this prohibition in chapter 19. Rashi said he thought that they would, these prohibitions were repeated so that if you violate these laws, you technically transgress two different commandments. Um, even Ezra thought, well... The Feast of Shavuot celebrates the first of the wheat harvest. Now scripture warns for the wheat, just as it did for the barley, you know, for, so it's, it's now, it's now relevant again, because you're doing another harvest. Rambam thinks though, he thinks that um, when you reap the harvest of your land here in verse 22, refers not to like to the whole harvest, but to the harvest mentioned in verse 10. The, uh, when you come to the land and you reap the omer, even though you have to reap the omer and you have to produce certain things with the omer, and it's very important, you get that omer, um, you can't, you still can't take it from the
the corners of your field or from your glean or from your gleanings. You can't kind of double dip your commandments and and you know not not take the uh, corners for yourself, but take them and use them for the omer. That doesn't work. You have to leave those for the poor, and you have to um, take the omer from somewhere else, from your regular our harvest, your regular harvest. All right, verse 23. Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, there shall be a rest day for you. Shabbaton, or Shabbason. A remembrance of a wailing sound, a holy convocation. All work of labor you shall not do, and you shall offer a fire offering to Hashem. All right, so this is Rosh Hashanah, although it's not called Rosh Hashanah here. It's called Yom Teruah in places. It's not called Yom Teruah here. It's not actually named. Um... A lot of stuff is just alluded to in this verse. It is more developed in the uh, in tradition. So, what's a Shabbaton? What's a day of rest? A Shabbaton in the Ashkenazi pronunciation. What does it? What does that mean? Like legally? What does it mean halakhically? It's to do. I mean, cause it's, there shall be a rest day for you. He said. It's you know. He says, don't do any work on it. But he's also saying like it's a rest day. It's a two different things. It's the same thing. What is it? Ramban says, This verse means there shall be a day of rest on which to repose, like on which to actually rest. And our sages have said that there shall be a rest day for you is a positive commandment, and thus it emerges that one who performs forbidden work on a festival day violates both a negative commandment and a positive commandment. And one who rests on it fulfills a positive commandment and refrains from breaking the negative commandment. And according to the opinion of the sages, we must say the appointed festivals are all exegetically compared to one another. For the expression of day of rest, though stated only in the Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot passages, is not stated in the Pesach passage or in the Shavuot passage. However, because they are all here kind of parallel, the sages have said they're all supposed to be Shabbaton, they're all supposed to be day of rest. Ramon says he saw in Makilta, Makilta, on the portion that begins Chachodesh. That's Makilta. No, Makilta. Yeah, Makilta. Yeah, it's a, it's an empty. There's no dog actually here. Makilta. I saw Makilta on the portion that begins Chachodesh. Why is it stated you shall observe this day, referring to the first day of Pesach? Why it was already stated with regard to the first and seventh days of Pesach, all work shall not be done on them. On the basis of the verse, all work shall not be done on them, I would know to prohibit only things that are classified as work. Malacha, remember a technical term. Malacha is a technical term. 39 categories of prohibited labor on a day of rest. Things that are classified as Shavut or Shavus. From where do I know to prohibit them? The Torah therefore states you shall observe this day in order to include things that are classified as Shavut. It might be thought that even on the intermediate days of the festival, these things classified as Shavut should be prohibited. And logic dictates that it should be so. The Torah therefore states the first day is a rest day, but not the intermediate days of the festival. So there's a difficulty with this passage in Makilta that Raman's going to make clear, which is what is Shavut? What is Shavut? It's not translated here because Raman's going to wrestle with what it means, and so we're just going to use the Hebrew word Shavut. Shavut. Now they expand the command, Raman says, to make the day a rest day is a command to rest on it completely, even from things that are not one of the 39 primary categories of work or their derivatives. However, what the sages mean by this is not clear to me. What is, in other words, what is Shavut? What is Shavut? For if you say that this is scriptural support for a rabbinic injunction, why would they use the expression Shavut? For the term Shavut in their parlance is always used with reference to something forbidden by virtue of their rabbinic enactments. So how would it be proper for them to say, how do we know that things forbidden as a rabbinic Shavut are forbidden on the basis of scripture? Because the way of asmachta expositions is to always teach the matter as if it were that those laws are biblical. They wouldn't say this rabbinic thing from where in the Torah do we know it. All right, so here's what he's talking about here. There are, there are a couple categories of laws in Judaism. There's biblical laws and there's rabbinic laws. Um, you know, biblical laws, is, you can point to some place in the Torah and say this, from this verse in the Torah we know that we're not allowed to do this or that we have to do that. Then there's laws that are of rabbinic origin. You know, the Torah, Shabbat al the Torah, the Oral Torah, 
And these things are in a different category. And generally speaking, a biblical prohibition takes precedence over a rabbinic prohibition. A little hierarchy there. However, what, what uh, Ramban's pointing out is that when the, when the Talmud or, or, or the, the Chazal, the tradition, when the tradition wants to attach a Bible verse to a rabbinic prohibition, which is very common, it's called a smachta, it's a, you see it all, all the time, when the, um, when, the, when the commentators want to attach a Bible verse to a rabbinic prohibition, they pretend it's not a rabbinic prohibition. They talk about it as if it were a biblical prohibition. So because Mechilta is using the word Shavuot here, which can be used as a technical term for everything rabbinically prohibited on the, uh, prohibited on the Sabbath, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be doing that. Like, it shouldn't use that word in order to attach a Bible verse to a, a rabbinic uh, tradition. It should have said something like, things that are not classified as work, from where do I know to prohibit them? The Shavuot is too technical of a term, he's saying. The Torah therefore states, he, he continues, the Torah therefore states a day of rest. Hence, it does not seem reasonable. His point is, doesn't, it doesn't seem reasonable to say that Mechilta is referring to rabbinic injunctions. We should understand it in a different way. We should understand Shavuot as as maybe some other concept to be able to understand what this verse means. Um, you know, what, what, what is this positive commandment to rest for, forbidding people to do? Ramban suggests this following understanding. He says, it appears to me that Mechilta is coming to say that we are commanded by the Torah to have a repose on the festival day, even from activities that are not classified as one of the 39 forbidden categories of work. So he says that Mechilta is not using Shavuot as a technical term for rabbinic prohibitions. He's saying it's just using it as a general a general idea of just, you know, activities that are not classified technically as work, but that would cause someone to exert themselves. So he's saying, you know, we should abstain, have a repose on the festival day, even from activities that are not classified as work, not, you know, and one should not exert himself for the entire day to measure the produce and weigh the fruit and the metals and fill the barrels with wine and move the utensils and stones from house to house or place to place within the courtyard. And if it's a walled city whose gates are closed at night, which means the entire city becomes a, one domain and you can technically um, carry things from one place to another within that domain without breaking the Sabbath, People could load upon the donkeys and even wine, grapes and figs, and every burden would they bring on the festival day. And the marketplace would be filled with goods for all manner of commerce. And the shop would open with a shopkeeper extending credit. And the money changers buy their tables with the gold coins laid out before them. And the laborers would be rising early to their work and hiring themselves out as on a weekday for these aforementioned activities and others like them. Just technically not malachas. You're not writing two letters. You're not tying a knot. Um, you mean it, you're doing a bunch of other stuff that's going to wear you out. It's not really resting. So Ramban says, as a result, the festival days, even the Sabbath itself, would degenerate into virtual weekdays, since in all of this there's nothing being done that is le legally classified as malacha, as technically one of the 39 categories of prohibited labor. Therefore, the Torah stated, there shall be a day of rest for you, meaning that the festival day shall be a day of resting and repose, not a day of exertion, and toil. And this is a good and appealing explanation of Mechilta. And then he keeps going. But afterward, I saw another Mechilta. So there's two Mechiltas. There's the Mechilta of Rabbi uh, Ish Ishmael. Yeah, Rabbi Ishmael. And then there's another Mechilta, Mechilta of Shimon ben Yochai, in which they state the, they state the teaching about the rest day in, in different terms. So here's what it, here's what it says. Um, on the basis of the verse, all work shall not be done on them. I, uh, uh, Exodus 12, 16. I know only the prohibition on the festival of work, the type for which one would be liable to a chatas offering if he performed it on the Sabbath. Right? An activity that falls under one of the 39 categories of malacha. Obviously, if you willfully do this, you're, it's punishable by being cut off. But if you accidentally do one of those 39 forms of work on the Sabbath, you're liable to a sin offering. A chatas offering is a sin offering. However, from where do I know that the prohibition of, on the festival of work of the type for which one would not be liable to a chatas offering if he performed it on the Sabbath? So these are rabbinic injunctions. That is, from where do I know that one may not climb a tree, nor ride an animal, nor swim on the face of the water, nor clap hands, nor slap thighs on the festival? 
You teach this, the Torah states, instead of simply work, any work. The extra word any, which is call. We talked about that before, sometimes better translated all, sometimes better translated any. Even so, I know only the prohibition against such non-work activities that are discretionary. You know, you don't, you never have to climb a tree, okay? There's never, there's no commandment that says you must climb a tree at some point. So there's never like a conflict. However, what about non-work activities done in performance of a mitzvah? From where do we know that these are forbidden as well? One may not consecrate an animal to be sacrificed later. One may not make vows of assessment. One may not make a harem, uh, which is to set aside a t uh, uh, an item for temple use. One may not separate teruma or ties on the festival. To teach this, the Torah states a rest day. So here's another angle on what it's what is it, what is a rest day? It's it comes to include more than just the 39 categories of prohibited labor. It comes to include to keep this positive commandment, one must refrain from lots of other activities as well that are just they're work-like, they're work-ish. Maybe they would involve physical or mental exertion, and it goes against the spirit of the thing to do that on the festival. Raman says, now, even though these varices differ in their language and in their expositions, perhaps they intend the same thing. Maybe these are scriptural attachments for rabbinically prohibited Shavu's activities. Maybe. But in any event, whether it's that way or whether it's not, the explanation of the word rest day is have repose on the festival from exertion and toil. And that's a proper and good explanation. I like that he ends up with that. It's not too technical. <clears throat> it emerges then that things classified as work activities are prohibited on the Sabbath by a negative commandment and carry the punishment of charis and death. The exertions and toil that violate the character of the day are prohibited by this positive commandment to rest. On the festival day, work is prohibited by a negative commandment punishable by lashes. So it's not as strict. The festival day is not as strict. That exertion is prohibited by the positive commandment. Based on this biblical commandment of resting, the prophet says of the Sabbath, which is from Isaiah, that all, verse all of us have heard before, you, you honor the Sabbath by not engaging in your own affairs, by not seeking your own needs or discussing what's forbidden. So it's expanded from this uh, technical idea of 39 categories of labor. All right. Raman says it's regard to this type of shavut, this type of not work but kind of work activity. They expound on Makilta above. The intermediate days of the festival have no shavut restrictions, no biblical shavut restrictions. Just the Yom Tov, just the first and last day of the festival have these types of restrictions. All right. A remembrance of a wailing sound. What's a remembrance of a wailing sound? Does that mean you just have to remember the last time you heard a child crying? Is that enough to celebrate Yom Teruah? Or well, what is technically being required here? Rashi thought this means verses of remembrance and verses of shofar to recall for Israel's sake the binding of Isaac in whose stead a ram was offered. Ramban says, but Rashi should have brought as well in his comment the mention of the kingship verses based on scriptural exposition. For it's not plausible to say the scripture had mentioned the verses of remembrance and verses of shofar, not mentioned the verses of kingship. What are they talking about with these verses? It comes from the Maxor for Rosh Hashanah, right? Every feast day has its own liturgy. And the uh, so this is a Rosh Hashanah Maxor. If you can see, it's real shiny. You might not be able to read the text. It says, the art scroll complete Maxor, Rosh Hashanah. And on Musaf, which is the additional Amidah for the festival, a lot of times there's some extra for, uh, you know, there's, so obviously on a festival that you don't do, um, you don't do all of the requests, you do a, you do a sanctification of the day instead. Right, we, we remember this. Anyone who came while we were doing that, uh, doing the prayers on Saturday morning over at, uh, over at uh, my mom and dad's place, there we, we didn't do, um, you know, for us it's, 
what's it shuva or like all these all these prayers like grant us uh the, the good weather or whatever like the uh, grant us good harvest all these requests the middle big section of the uh, amida we didn't do that we never did that because you don't do that on sabbath um instead you sanctify the day so on musaf you have the sanctification of the day um and rosh hashanah during that part of the amida there are are lots of uh readings there's a section on god's kingship there's a a section on remembrance and there's a section on blowing the shofar it says verses right ramban says verses of remembrance and verses of shofar and verses of they're not they're not bible verses they're just liturgical prayers so there's three sections on uh, on rosh hashanah there's three extended sections in the middle of the of the musaf amida and and rashi mentioned two of them uh and ramban says why didn't you mention all three of them buddy uh, they're all kind of parallel they're all really important and you can find them all in that verse ramban says the sages have already expounded them from the verse numbers 10 10 they shall be a remembrance for you before your god i am hashem your god why does it say i am hashem your god there it's a, an allusion to the verses of kingship you can mention the verses of kingship just based on that phrase being there However, that's uh, you, Ramban wants us to understand this. This is not. This is just an allusion to those verses being said. It's not like an outright commandment. There, it's it's a smakta. It's a rabbinic attachment of 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 a practice of a decree to a scripture verse. The sage has stated explicitly: if one is unable to fulfill the requirements of shofar and of reciting these three sets of verses. Makuya, Sikronos, and Shofaros, Kingship, Remembrance, and Shofar Blast. One goes to the place where they will sound the Shofar and does not go to the place where they will recite the verses. Right? So if you live between two towns, you're out in the middle of nowhere, and the synagogue in one town is going to recite these verses, and the synagogue in the other town is going to blow the Shofar. So you can only get one or the other. Which one do you pick? The Gemara says, well, you got to go to the place where they're going to blow the Shofar. Now the Gemara asks itself, right, why would you have to say that? It's obvious you'd have to go where the shofar would be sounded because the mitzvah of shofar is biblical and the mitzvah of reciting the verses is rabbinic. You'd always pick the biblical mitzvah if you have to pick one and the other is rabbinic. You'd pick the biblical mitzvah. The Gemara answers, this is not a difficulty. The ruling is needed to teach that even where the recital of verses is a certainty and the sounding of the shofar is only a possibility, you should go to the city we have a chance to, to hear the shofar right so if you're you live almost halfway between these two towns and you're sure you can make it on time to the uh you're sure you can make it on time to the uh reading of the verses but you're not sure if you can make it on time to the other town to hear the shofar you should still go there even if you're not as sure that you're going to make it on time his point here is that these readings, the readings of these three sets of verses are definitely not a biblical commandment. So, the plain meaning of this verse, our remembrance of a wailing sound, cannot be to say these verses during Musa Rosh Hashanah, during the Amidah. It doesn't, it doesn't compute. You know, that wouldn't be the way you would normally understand that verse. The verse must mean something different. Rashi must have made a mistake. Rather, Ramban says... The sense of there shall be a remembrance of a wailing sound is like that of Numbers 29.1, it shall be a day of wailing sound for you. Our verse is thus saying that we shall make a wailing sound on this day and it will be a remembrance for us before God. This is like what is stated below, you shall sound the trumpets and they shall be a remembrance for you before your God. This is Numbers 10.10. Now, in light of the fact that scripture states in Numbers 10.10, on a day of your gladness and on your festivals and on your new moons, you shall sound the trumpets that's not, that's not shofars, it's different. It's those silver trumpets that Moses had to make. It should sound the trumpets over your burnt offering and over your uh, pe uh, feast peace offerings. Whereas here in our verse it commands simply a wailing sound. 
it's not associated with sacrifices. You know, there are going to be sacrifices on Rosh Hashanah. But it's not on the sacrifice. It's not connected with the sacrifice. It's just the commandments on its own. We see that this wailing sound of Rosh Hashanah is not the same as that other sounding, which is with trumpets and over the offering, whereas today it's with a shofar and it's not over the offering. It's an obligation even outside the temple, it's everywhere. For at the time of our verses commanded Moses, God had not yet commanded Moses to make trumpets. Moreover, every unspecified wailing sound is done with a shofar. As it is stated below, Leviticus 25, 9, you shall sound a shofar of wailing. So it's just connecting the idea with shofar. So how would you describe biblically what, is it, what does the shofar sound like? Well, it sounds like a sound of wailing. So a wailing sound that's not specified as to how you make it is understood to always be done with a shofar. Now, Scripture does not explicate the reason for this commandment of Rosh Hashanah. Why the wailing sound of the shofar? And why do we need a remembrance before God on this day more than on the rest of the days of the year? And why does he command this day to be a holy convocation at all? However, since it comes in the month of Yom Kippur, at the beginning of the month, it seems evident that on it will be a judgment before him, maybe he, may he be blessed, and that on them he judges peoples. On Rosh Hashanah, he, the righteous judge sits on the throne, and afterward in ten days' time he forgives the sins of his servants. Thus the true nature of Rosh Hashanah, as it is known in Israel from the mouth of the prophets and the holy forebears, is intimated by Scripture. So there's a hint here. There's a hint here of what's going on in Rosh Hashanah. Uh, Rosh Hashanah. Although it's not clear that God is judging everyone on this day just from Scripture, there is a hint. Of course, the tradition goes very deep into the concept of judgment on Rosh Hashanah. The Torah itself does not. Verse 26, Hashem spoke to Moshe, saying, But on the tenth of the seventh month, it is the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. There shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall afflict yourselves. You shall offer a fire offering to Hashem. You shall not do any work. Etsem hayom hazeh, on the essence of this day. For it is the day of atonement to provide you atonement before Hashem, your God. All right. Verse 27 begins with the Hebrew word ach. Ach, which is translated here as but. You guys have verse 27 beginning with a but or an only or a however or something like that? Also. Also? Surely. Surely, yeah. Yeah, sometimes ach is translated as truly or surely as well, and Ramban's going to get into, this, into some of those as well. So Rashi said uh, all, instances of, all instances of two words, ach and rak, in the Torah signify exclusions. Here, the exclusion indicated by Ach is that Yom Kippur atones for those who repent, but it does not atone for those who do not repent. So the word, halachically, or maybe, um, you know, even agotically, I don't know, like the word is a hint at some level of interpretation beneath the surface level, maybe. Um, there's, there's some, some, for somebody, it's not going to be the Day of Atonement, right? That word at the beginning lets us know that somebody's going to be excluded from this. For someone, someone's not going to get any atonement. And Rashi said, well, the people who don't repent are the ones who don't get any atonement on this day. Raman elaborates, Accordingly, the explanation of Scripture is that whereas on the first day of the month there shall be for you, for everyone, a day of remembrance and a wailing sound, meaning that everyone will be judged, however, only for some of you will, will there be on the tenth of this month a day of atonement. Accordingly, the way the sages understand the sense of ach here, it has the connotation of only. Let me give some other examples of how the word can be translated only in different verses. Similarly, in the verse, but on the 15th day of the seventh month, in verse 39 below here, Scripture is saying, only on the 15th day you shall celebrate Shem's festival for a seven-day period, that is not seven days consecutively, for the offering of a Chagiga does not override the Sabbath. And so there's like a festival offering every day of, of uh, Sukkot. Uh, one of those is going to be a Sabbath, because any seven days in a row is going to have a Sabbath on it. Um, so the Chagiga is offered every day during that period, but except for the Sabbath. All right. So that's why the word is there, ach, 
exception, exception. In similar fashion, you may interpret the word in the case of all the commandments that use this word according to the tradition received by our sages of blessed memory. So there's always a hint of something there that's, that's uh, being accepted from the statement. Similarly, we can explain the verse um, in Genesis 44, 28, only he has been torn to pieces. Ach, he has been torn to pieces to mean that nothing other than being torn has happened to him. And also for the children of Israel and children of Judah have done only, uh, been only been doing what is wrong in my eyes since their youth, for the children of Israel only anger me. Um, in Jeremiah 32, 30. So this is like a different way of understanding the word, just to understand it as only. Only. According to the plain way of interpretation, the word ach is like the word achen, which is indeed. Right? So this is like the Shirley translation. Indeed, the matter is known, Exodus 24. Indeed, like many shall die, Psalm 82. Indeed, on the tenth of the month of the Day of Atonement, an assurance of the truth of the matter. Like, it will definitely be a Day of Atonement. You definitely need to afflict yourselves, and you definitely need to not do any work. And, like, truly, even in spite of, of the judgment on the first day of the month, there's still an opportunity to have mercy on the tenth day. And then he gives uh, many more verses in which the word ach can be translated as truly or surely or something like that. What is the, es uh, the essence of this day? The essence of this day, verse 28, you shall not do any work on the essence of this day, but etzem hayom hazeh. What is etzem? What is the etzem of a day? Um, which translated here is essence of this day. You may have something different. Guy in my street with a really loud car and I have trouble concentrating when he drives by. <laughs> the commentators have said that its meaning is on this day itself. It's Radak who said it's on this day itself. Similarly, in the verse, you shall not eat bread or roasted kernels or plump kernels until the etzem of this day, again, verse 14. The meaning is until the day itself. And similarly, similarly in the verse, and like the etzem of the heaven in purity, meaning like the heaven itself in purity. Okay, so that's one way of understanding that word, on the day itself. However, Ramban says we can't explain, we, he wants to make sure we don't get the wrong idea about this word etzem, because sometimes the word etzem seems to mean during the daytime of the day, um, right? Because the Hebrew word yom can mean day, but it can mean like day time. So it can mean like a 24-hour period, but it can also mean like the time when the sun is up. Um, so etzem hayom is like the, is the day time of the day. Sometimes it's, tra it's, uh, in, it's understood that way. Like, uh, on the etzem of the day that Noah came, the ark, etzem of the day of taking the legions of the land of Egypt, these things all happened into daytime, in the daytime. Roman says that can't be what it means here because we know that the rest on Yom Kippur is from evening to evening. It's a full 24-hour period. It's not just during the day. Now, Scripture did not mention you know, etzem hayom hazeh with, with regard to the Sabbath nor with regard to the festivals except for the festival of Shavuot and Yom Kippur. So what's different about those two? Similarly, Scripture stated with regard to the prohibition against eating new grain until the second day of Pesach, until the essence of this day, verse 14. What appears to be the reason for this is that since it states in regard to Shavuot, from the day of your bringing the Omer of the waving, you shall count 50 days, and then it states, and you shall offer a new meal offering to Hashem from your dwelling places you shall bring, and the rest of the matter where Scripture commands the Shavuot offerings at length, because of this, Scripture had to state, you shall convoke on the essence of this day, this day in and of itself, to teach the Shavuot day itself is holy and forbidden for the performance of work. It's not dependent on bringing the Omer. It's not dependent on the offerings of the day. It has an intrinsic holiness. Shavuot has an intrinsic holiness. Of course, all of the... Um, feasts have an intrinsic holiness, but you might think that Shavuot wouldn't have an intrinsic holiness because if you're not bringing the Omer and you're not you know, able to do the offerings, maybe it's, maybe the holiness is gone. Maybe it's only holy because you do those things in the temple. So scripture wants to clarify, no, that's not the case. It's holy in and of itself. 
Similarly, Raman says, similarly in regard to Yom Kippur, since Scripture stated, you shall afflict yourselves and offer a fire offering to Hashem, the Torah portion of Chari Mot, it also tied the atonement to the offerings in the temple and the he goat sent to Azazel. Because of this, it had to state here, you shall not do any work on the day itself, for it is the day of atonement in and of itself to provide you atonement independently of the atonement of the offerings. So the day itself has its own power, its own holiness that's intrinsic to it. Similarly, the uh, verse, until the essence of this day with regard to the new grain, means until that day itself. Which means to say that even if the Omer offering was not brought, the commandment applies with regard to the day itself. The new crops prohibited pr prior to it and permitted after it. The day itself is important, not just because of what happens on it in the temple. We find further that Scripture mentions on the essence of this day with regard to matters decreed to occur at specific times. Thus, Scripture states regarding Noah, on the essence of this day, Noah came into the ark. And on the essence of this day, all the legions of Hashem left the land of Egypt during the Exodus. And he spoke to Moses on the essence of a day, a certain day, um, that he was going to ascend a mountain and die. And the reason for the expression on the essence of this day in these verses, Ramban says, is that otherwise it would have been plausible to think that, for example, Noah brought many of the beasts and fowl into the ark beforehand and only just finished the job on that day. That it didn't all happen in one day, it was just finished on that day. So the Etzim and Yom has a, so it tells us that, no, no, it all happened on that one day, Noah brought all these creatures into the ark. Same with the children of Israel departing from Egypt. It would be plausible to think that this was just the last group, the f they're finally all gone now, uh, but some may be left early. But no, actually what happened is they all de actually departed on the same day. In one, one, one day. Also, you know, when Moses ascended to um, Mount of, the Mount of Abarim, Mount Nebo, and uh, to die on the mountain, God told him on that very day. He didn't tell him beforehand. He told him on that very day. And when Abraham circ uh, circumcised all the uh, people in his household on the essence of one day, he actually did it all in one day. Ramban says, It appears to me further that the etzem of everything is its power and its strength. The word being derived from the expression, my power and the otsem of my hand. Same uh, same three letters. Ayan tzad imem. Likewise, we find the verse, this one dies in full strength of its perfection. All this, these verses, otsem, this word otsem can mean power can mean mar or might. Accordingly, in the verse, like the etzem of the heaven and purity would be like the purity of the thing they saw was clear and strong, like the strength of the heaven's purity. Again, this essence of these days is in, like, they have it in themselves. Yom Kippur has a holiness intrinsic to itself. It has a power intrinsic to itself, a strength on which one can find mercy um, on the basis of just that day having that power in itself that's obviously given from God but like everything else like all other power but the power is attached to the day and not necessarily to the rituals in the temple that happen on that day it's interesting you know though you know we hear about God's timing and when God does stuff and uh, his appointed time and it's interesting that the power is attached to those days that he said do this on this day, Shavuot and Yom Kippur, and do this now, Noah, do it now, you know, circumcise now. Yeah. Um, that when we hear God say, we, you need to do this now, that really there's something extra special in that he means you should do it right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? And though all those examples of his, you know, his power was directed at the time he said to do it, not before it, not after it, but you better do it when he said to do it. That just, it really seems interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, like, it looks like on a surface level, for example, that these, you know, Pesach is celebrated because if that was the day that the children of Israel left Egypt. But to understand it this way is is uh, another level of understanding, which is that the reason Israel left Egypt on that day was because it was Pesach, and that's the day that had the power mm -hmm. intrinsic to it. That was the day that they were going to be able to leave. Um, so, like, you know, the sages will talk about even, even uh, like Abraham, 
doing something special on a feast days or whatever, even like w before there was anything to commemorate. Um, because he understood the power in that day. He understood that there's uh, a unique spiritual energy on that day. It seems like if you don't celebrate or take the time or, you know, on Yom Kippur or Shavuot or any of the appointed times, um, that you miss that, you know, even now when those celebrations, when those festivals come up, that you miss that special, whatever it is God has for you on that day, it only happens on that day. So um, how much more important is that to honor that commandment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't get it. You can't make up. Well, at Pesach, you can technically make up for it. There's Pesach. There's a second Pesach. If you were, uh, for some reason, you couldn't eat the first Pesach. But yeah, there's generally speaking, there's no way to make it. There's no way to make it up. You have to be there at the time doing the thing <coughs> to gain the uh, spiritual benefit. All right. I think we're on verse 29. For any soul who will not be afflicted on the essence of this day will be cut off from its people. And any soul who will do any work on the essence of this day, I will destroy that soul from among its people. You shall not do any work. It is an eternal decree throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. It is a Sabbath of resting for you, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth of the month in the evening, from evening to evening, shall you rest on your rest day. Ramban notes that there's a, a weird halakhic, like uh, rabbinic interpretation that the essence of the day may actually also mean like technically just the day and not the day plus the half an hour before and after that's usually added to a festival or a holy day. Like not from sundown to the three stars, but just from, from, the, from the cutoff to cutoff, directly from the end of one day to the end of the next day. I don't know. Verse 33, Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month is the festival of Sukkot, a seven-day period for Hashem. On the first day is a holy convocation, all work of labor you shall not do. For a seven-day period you shall offer a fire offering to Hashem. On the eighth day there shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall offer a fire offering to Hashem. Is it a, is, is a day of atzeret. It is an, or it's, it's a, it's an atzeret. Um which is translated here as, it's a day of continuance. All work of labor you shall not do. So what's an atzeret? Rashi said, um, based on just one grammatical idea in the word atzeret, which is to restrain, um, Rashi said, God says, I have held you back before me like a king who invited his sons to a banquet for a certain number of days. Once their time to depart arrived, the king said, I request of you, linger with me one more day. Your departure is hard for me. The above is a quote from Rashi. And there are words of Agadan Vayikor Rabbah. Um, interestingly, our versions of Vayikor Rabbah today do not have that, but you can find some of it in uh, the Talmud. There's a... So yeah, it's, it's Seret. It's a day of uh, continuous. It's Seret, interestingly enough, Shavuot is, is sometimes called Atzeret in the older literature um, because it's got this idea of consummation and completion. And completion. So after the Omer, <coughs> you know, you count 49 days and then the Shavuot is the 50th day. It's the last day. It seems like it's part of the count, but you, it's not actually. You don't actually count it. It's its own, it's its own day. You know, it, on, you, you count all 49 days. You don't count 50 on Shavuot. You'd think you would because it's this count... 50th day but um you don't it's beyond counting it's it's a uh, it's sort of a completion but it's sort of a new thing as well and uh that's the same idea here there's the you know shavuot is seven days it's not eight days shavuot is seven days shemini atzeret is its own festival that just happens to be the day after the last day of sukkot and um you know lots of stuff happens on that day traditionally this the torah scroll is is re-rolled i think on shemini atzeret um, but uh, the Kabbalistic idea here is that, you know, all of the emanations come sort of individually during these first seven days, but then they're all there together on the last, on the eighth, on the eighth day. Uh, so it's like, you know, it's a hint, it's a hint, right? It's a hint of a new cycle, a new world, 
um, something that's been completed and, and in some way also something that's starting again. You know, it's a real picture of the world to come. Like, uh, and many have made the allusion, of course, to the musical octave. There's, there's seven notes in, the, in a major scale. And once you play the eighth note, you know, you're, you're starting another scale, but it doesn't sound right until you play the eighth one. You know, even though it's the same as the first note and technically is not like a, another note. Um, in some ways it is, you know, it's anyway, these are the appointed festivals of Hashem that you shall proclaim as holy convocations to offer a fire offering to Hashem, a burnt offering, and its meal offering, a feast offering, and its libation each day's requirement on its day. Aside from Hashem's Sabbaths, and aside from your gifts, aside from all your vows, and aside from all your freewill offerings, which you'll present to Hashem. I like that. You know, this, this, uh, this thing you have to give on the festival does not absolve you. It doesn't double count as something that you vowed to give earlier. That's a different thing. But on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you gather in the crop of the land, you shall celebrate Hashem's festival for a seven-day period. The first day is a rest day, and the eighth day is a rest day. You shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of a citron tree, the branches of date palms, the twig of a plated tree, and brook willows. And you shall rejoice before Hashem your God for a seven-day period. You shall celebrate it as a festival for Hashem, a seven-day period in the year, an eternal decree for your generations in the seventh month. Shall you celebrate it? You shall dwell in shelters for a seven-day period. It's Sukkot. You shall dwell in shelters for a seven-day period. All the natives in Israel shall dwell in shelters so that your generations will know that I caused the children of Israel to dwell in shelters when I took them. <laughs> from the land of Egypt, I am Hashem, your God. And Moses declared the appointed festivals to the children of Israel. So there's a lot we can glean from this passage on Sukkot. The first thing Ramban gleans on it, or gleans from it, uh, is something he took from Rashi, which is that the, the festival here, from verse uh, 39, it says, the 15th day of the seventh month, well, it needs to be the time when you gather in the crop of the land. This is fruit trees. So this harvest, uh, you know, it, it has to be in a, the correct time. Like if you in, if you calculate the months incorrectly, if you start your year at the wrong time, you may end up not having any fruit here for the festival, and that wouldn't work because the commandment here says that it has to be the time when you gather in the crop of the land. So Rashi says. This teaches that this festival of the seventh month should be at the time of gathering. From here we learn that the judges are commanded to intercalate months into the years, for if there, there is no intercalation, sometimes it will fall out in the middle of the summer, or eventually even in the winter. Right, so we talked about this. The, uh, the Jewish calendar in a short year has 354 days, uh, 12 lunar cycles, 12 lunar cycles, about 354 days, which leaves some more days, there's about 11 days that you have to uh, make up you know, the way we do it is we just add a couple of days to every month and our months in our calendar are not correlated with the moon at all. But in the Hebrew calendar, they're definitely correlated with the moon. So you have to make up for this discrepancy. So every so often you add another month to reset the festivals so that they fall in the correct season. Now, interestingly, I just learned yesterday that the uh, Islamic calendar does not intercalate. It does not intercalate. It's a lunar calendar solely, so like every year, all of the uh, feasts of Islam are like 11 days earlier in the year. So they sort of just migrate through the year and they're always at different seasons. So that's kind of interesting. Maybe it doesn't make a whole lot of difference when you're living in the desert, although they're not far away from Israel. So you would think it would be, they, you would think they would do something similar. It's real interesting that they, did, that they didn't, that they're that, they're that different. I don't know what the what it means, but it's interesting. All right. So Rashi, I'll tell you right now, there's a little bit of a problem with Rashi here because the sages taught that we 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 learn we have to intercalate from a different verse in the Torah. But uh, Ramban's Ramban, I think, will probably get there. When you gather in the quote, uh, so Ramban, the next thing Ramban says is quote is a quote from Sifra, which I think is where Rashi got his comment. Um, Sifra says, when you gather in the crop of the land, this means that you shall intercalate months into the year so that you will make the festival of Sukkot during the gathering of the produce. It might be thought that Sukkot must be made only upon the gathering of all the produce. 
to teach otherwise the Torah states, you shall make the festival of Sukkot when you gather in from your threshing floor and from your wine cellar. That's in Deuteronomy. It's not in the verse we just read. From the threshing floor implies, but not necessarily all the threshing floor. You just have to give some of it, not all of it. And from the wine cellar, similarly. But if the Torah had stated only this latter verse, when you gather in from your threshing floor and from your wine cellar, it might be thought that Sukkot can be made as soon as part of the crop has been harvested. The Torah therefore states in this verse here, when you gather in the crop of the land, which implies all of the crop, when, you, when, you're, like, when you're finished gathering in the crop of the land. So which is it? How is this conflict to be reconciled? Sifra says, the combined effect of these two verses is to teach you shall endeavor to intercalate a month into the year so that you make the festival of Sukkot upon completing the majority. So not just part, but not all. The majority of gathering in all the fruits. Ramban objects to Rashi's, what Rashi got out of the Sifra verse. The sages have already derived the obligation of intercalation from the verse, guard the month of springtime, Deuteronomy 16.1. In other words, the month of Nisan has, Nisan has to be in spring in order for Pesach, Shavuot to fall out at the correct times of the seasons in order for them to, to approximate the times of the harvest. However, their scripture teaches that we intercalate specifically for the first ripened produce, whereas here it teaches that we also intercalate for the fruits of the trees. For those of the sages taught, on account of three factors we intercalate a month into the year, on account of the first ripened produce, it's the barley, on account of the fruit of the trees, and on account of the equinox. The equinox. So if you if you if you know when the you know the equinox, the occurrence of the equinox could trigger an, an, an intercalation. That's the spring, right? The spring equinox. Like halfway okay. between the halfway between the shortest and the longest days of the year. Can I ask you a question? Sure. You think the farmer's almanac has anything to do with the lunar? I think there's some stuff in the farmer's al almanac about moons, like a harvest moon and like planter's moon and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Any of the... Maybe they follow the lunar calendar. I think, yeah, I think some of them must think about, like, at least look at the phases of the moon and stuff. I know that, like, you know, some of the light from the moon, like more light from the moon at night, you, you know, plants can uh, use it, I think. But I don't know enough about farming to be able to answer that question, really. Mm -hmm. If Sarah were here, she'd be able to answer it. I just wonder where it came from. Yeah, I, I don't know. All right, well, it's 11 o'clock. We'll wrap up Leviticus 23 next week and keep mm -hmm. moving forward. Okay. How much time do you spend studying on these things? Um, usually I'll read for about two, two and a half hours um, to prep a one hour talk like this. Wow. Although if I run into something um, a little bit hairy and I have to look a bunch of stuff up, it can go longer. Mm -hmm. you enjoy this sort of thing? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, I like to read. I like to learn things. It's not as good as taking a nap, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate your effort. It's okay. good. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is, it's good. It's a good time. Everybody, everybody needs to learn something. All right, well, I'm going to go take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks you, for Jake. coming. Everybody have a good thanks, day. Jake. Yep. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Jake.